Thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you for the kind invitation. And thank you especially for coming out at 4.30 on a hot afternoon. This is not an easy thing, and I am genuinely grateful to see such a good turnout. Hopefully, I will make it worth your while. Um, we're going to talk about milk, and this is not an expected topic for an Asian studies lecture. Uh, we don't associate milk with China. We don't associate China as being a milk drinking country. And certainly these were the expectations that I had when I went into the project. I went into the project because I'm interested in an area of the country that, as it turns out, is a very prolific producer of dairy, of milk and milk products. Uh, but I came to it because I like the place rather than going into the commodity first. Uh, but if you uh, need to be convinced, and I certainly needed to, of the importance of milk to China today and of the importance of China to the global milk industry, uh, there are some stats that are relatively, I'll, I'll keep the data on a short leash. Um, I do have a paper actually, if anybody really wants the numbers, I'm more than happy to pass that around, but I'll keep the numbers short uh, in, in this actual talk. Uh, China is currently the third largest producer of dairy and dairy products in the world. Uh, this is coming from a hundred years ago when they had absolutely no organized dairy industry. It has happened very fast. Uh, anybody who has been to China over recent years will notice a year-on-year -year increase, not only in the amount of milk that's being produced, uh, but the variety of products. When I first started going to China in the early 1990s, uh, you couldn't get milk. If somebody went to, I was living in the uh, capital of Jinan, the Shandong capital, the provincial capital of Jinan, somebody went to Qingdao for the weekend, we would uh, demand that they bring back a backpack full of yogurt because there was absolutely no way to get it in the city. And this is a provincial capital not that long ago. If you go to uh, any small town in China now, 10 to 15% of floor space in a large shopping, you know, a Walmart style shopping mall, uh, or even just a, you know, a little mom and pop operation, 10 to 15% is going to be milk. And it won't just be milk, it'll be milk, it'll be milk powder, it'll be milk products, uh, milk candy, yogurt. Uh, there are a million different ways to enjoy milk in China. And I actually have the experience of coming back to the United States and thinking, yeah, this isn't quite as good, uh, the stuff we make here, with the exception of Cornell Dairy, which is objectively delicious. Um, the ice cream, anyway, I won't go any further than that. Um, any Chinese person, if you mention milk to them now, you are very likely to get a response of Sanlu. And Sanlu, uh, I heard a couple of laughs, that's what I was going for. Sanlu is the company that was responsible, primarily responsible, for the 2008 milk poisoning crisis, where milk was uh, uh, adulterated with an industrial chemical called melamine. And this sickened uh, hundreds of thousands of babies, killed a few. It was a big moment in social activism in China. So these are just a, a couple of little snapshots. And this is how I came to this project, by just you know, getting a little snapshot of this, a little snapshot of that. And the, the problem was then making a big logical picture out of these small pictures that I was seeing. Any one of these pictures would tell you that milk is important how much is made, how much is consumed, and the role it plays in society and people's lives. How do you put it all together into one picture? I decided that maybe a good thing to do is not put it together in one picture, but to look at each of these pictures individually. And this is, again, uh, something that came to me over a process of years, and it did so because I'm a historian. I'm trained as a historian, and historians tell stories. It's right there in the name, historian. Every story, including one that's built on data, including one that's built on numbers, every story still has a logic. There's an arc, there's a natural narrative that goes into the story. And when you examine milk, there are a lot of different ways to examine this narrative. So what I'd like to do today is to tell you the same story three times. Uh, the story of dairy over China's 20th century, and that of course goes up till now. Uh, starting with production, the logic of production, and then consumption, and then to talk about meaning. So we're gonna go over the same 100 years three different times, but each time is going to be a very different story. So to start, to start, I should figure out which computer I'm using. There we go. To start with production. What is the logic of production? It's very easy to sum up. Bigger is better. 
Chinese production, the story of dairy in China, is a story of scale. Everything gets bigger, everything gets more efficient, uh, production gets more, production, uh, again, we start in 1900 with no organized dairy industry. We end up in 2007 with the third largest industry in the world. Obviously, that's a story of growth, but growth is not unitary. Uh, different parts of the country grew at different rates. Different parts of the sector, because dairy is a very complicated production chain, grew at different rates. Um, different types of uh, investment political and financial, went into the sector at different times. So even production, yes, we're getting bigger and bigger every year, but it's not one story and it's not all happening at the same rate. But to start the story of production, the first question, what did Chinese dairy production look like 100 years ago or even further? Uh, was there dairy production in China? Of course there was. China has a huge uh, part of the country that's pastoral, grassland. Uh, Manchuria, Mongolia, Qinghai, uh, and these were filled with sheep, with cows, with horses, so of course a lot of milk is being made. The real question isn't mil is not, is milk being made, but uh, is somebody collecting it? Is somebody processing it? Uh, either to store it or maybe even to sell? And it turns out, yes, it was. So I hit the button too soon. Uh, it's hard to see, but this is a picture from a 12th century um, temple mural, and it shows two people milking an ox. Wait a minute. Okay, no one from the ag school here. I just said I that they were milking an ox. Coming out, people. I know it's 4.30, but you don't milk an ox. <laughs> no, really? Okay, anyway. <laughs> milking a female cow. That's where you get milk from. Um, uh, milking a female cow. Um, what are they doing with it? They're making it into a variety of different products, surprising variety of different products, even at this early stage. You have something called tihu, you have something called lao, you have something called su. Uh, these are discussed in various different kinds of sources, uh, but among the sources that you've got, you have local gazetteers. So these are local uh, uh, description of, of localities, and they include local products. So places, uh, there are places that would have these dairy products, and it's not always from cows, sometimes it's from water buffalo. Uh, they would have them and they would sell them and this would be one of, the, one of the things that they're known for commercially. But really, if you talk about an organized dairy industry, you're talking about the arrival of Westerners and in particular, the arrival of dairy breeds like uh, Holstein, like Simmental, like Ayrshire. And the reason this story starts with dairy breeds is because these uh, animals are much more productive than Chinese native breeds. So you have Chinese native yellow cows, Huang Niu, uh, the um, uh, Holstein is about four times more productive in uh, dairy production, uh, about six times more productive than Baikal, which is the breed that's most common in Mongolia. So the introduction of these breeds was really the origin of an organized dairy industry. But the introduction of these breeds came along different roads. Uh, one, let's see, there we are. One, uh, sorry, one was this road here. They came by sea. They went to the big cities, they went to Qingdao, they went to Shanghai. Uh, in the mid 19th century, they were brought in at very high cost. These were expensive animals. Um, and they were the origin of an organized dairy industry in these big cities. Places like Hong Kong, when I say they're expensive, uh, just before World War I, uh, um, dairy farm in Hong Kong had, I think, only about 20 head of cattle that they were importing from Australia. The ship sank and the loss almost bankrupted the company. These are very significant investments and they're very valuable in these cities where they were located. The second way that they came in, though, was overland from Russia, and that's to this area up here which becomes the real heart of the dairy industry. Uh, Russians came, they came to work on the railroad. This is the China Eastern Railway. And they uh, brought dairy herds with them for their own consumption. In particular, at around the time of the Russian Revolution, World War I, they came as refugees, farmers from European Russia, and they brought entire herds with them. So by the time you get to the early 20th century, this place, which is very uh, uh, lightly populated and a beautiful place to raise animals, 
um, is about half populated, uh, half of the entire herd is dairy breeds. So this is an area that's very naturally going to produce a dairy excess. And the difference between these two places shows up in the early 20th century that they make milk in different ways. So if you look at the big cities, uh, so we'll start up here. If you look at this area up here, very low population, very high population of very productive and valuable dairy breeds. So uh, how does their dairy uh, develop? How does their dairy industry develop? Well, they've got this railway running through the middle. So we had about 5,000 house households, small households, four cows each on the average. Every morning the train would come by, they would take their milk to a collection station, and it would go here to the city of Harbin. And Harbin was the big dairy. And what did they do with the dairy in Harbin? They processed, processed it into something that could travel. So they had about 75% of this huge dairy excess they were making that became cheese and butter and the industrial protein casein. And that was all to sell at a distance. The other model was this one down here, and this is to serve cities. And this is where the dairy assets were much more expensive. And uh, the, the model of production there was dairies that owned their own animals and produced, uh, produced for a local market. So the dairies that developed in these big cities, they tended to scale. So whereas here you had a lot of small farmers that were feeding a, a central industry, down here you have small dairies that over time have an incentive to grow into big dairies because that's where all the money is. So you start at the beginning of the century in Beijing and Tianjin and places like this, uh, dairy would have maybe uh, five, 10 cows. By World War II, by about the 1940s, these have grown into big, very well capitalized uh, commercial entities with maybe 60, 70, 100 cows. Uh, but they weren't the only ones producing. You also had another sector that existed alongside. So this is the traditional sector. This is uh, Huangdiao. This is a yellow cow. This is a Holstein. Why did the traditional sector not work? Well, you can see when you put all the numbers together, uh, this is from some surveys from the 1930s. These are the small producers. This is one big producer. When you put, when you do all the numbers, uh, there's very little way for the small producers to survive. That's the, the, the takeaway message from it. So the small producers, uh, they have less efficient animals, but they still have to feed them. They have um, uh, smaller distribution networks, but they still have to pay for their labor. So what we learn from this is that an efficient dairy is really based, an efficient dairy industry is really based on these expensive and rare breeds. Um, we can uh, go over some of these things like World War II. We can talk about them in the uh, Q&A. Um, jumping to the 1950s, you have a massive transformation of the industry again. So Japan invades. All of the dairy producing areas are under Japanese occupation. Uh, the industry essentially stagnates. It isn't destroyed. 1945, the war is over. They're, everybody's ready. You have these huge uh, investments that are being put into these mega dairies that are going to follow the, the Eastern model. They're going to look like the ones in Shanghai. Uh, then you have 1949, founding of the People's Republic of China. All of that is off the table. And China, the Chinese government, takes over the initiative for what the dairy industry is going to look like. And they have very strong ideas about this. Uh, two. One is a model of what we could call autarky. So the Chinese communists had come out of a guerrilla war, and they wanted people to be self-sufficient in food production. This was the model they had had when they were up in the mountains of, of uh, Yan'an. So in the 1950s, they take these expensive dairy breeds, and they move them throughout the country. So now uh, a hospital has a couple of cows. Now a grade school has a couple of cows, and everybody is supposed to be making their own milk for their own consumption. That's one model. The second model is scale. And where did they get this idea? From the Soviet Union, from Ukraine in particular, which becomes a global leader in industrial production of dairy. 
And this is one of the ways that the Soviet Union was helping Ukraine rebuild after the Second World War. So uh, what, what does uh, China do with this? They spread out production during the 1950s, spread it out to these smaller cities, places that wouldn't have had dairy before, like Kunming and Taiyuan. Uh, 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 they spread out the dairy assets. And again, these are expensive. And the other thing they do is they take places like Hailar, like Lanzhou, cities that are sitting on the grassland. And they want to use dairy as a way of industrializing the grassland. So these places have cows, they have grass, they don't have an organized dairy industry. The scale investment from the PRC goes into things like this. There are two big iconic projects from the 1950s, both from the first uh, five-year plan. So high, high priority for the PRC government, uh, big dairy in Gannan in Lanzhou, and the Hailar dairy, uh, way up at the very top of Inner Mongolia. And these are remarkably successful, these initiatives. Um, herd size, so the number of cows you have, goes up dramatically. Basically, in the cities, it doubles. And um, the amount of milk being produced goes up dramatically. And this goes on through the 1950s. Um, the Great Leap Forward in the late 1950s is a big problem, but not as big as, as uh, one might think. Uh, the real problem becomes cultural revolution in the, in the mid and late 1960s. And the problem with the Cultural Revolution is not that the dairies were purged, not that the cows were killed, but that you need to have expertise and you need to have planning to run a dairy production chain. Uh, you need to have machinery, and that machinery was coming from the Soviet Union. Well, not anymore, because now China is not friends with the Soviet Union, on and on and on. So it's the mechanized sector that really suffered during the 19th late 60s up to the 70s. In the late 1970s, you have the Deng Xiaoping reforms, which if you talk about agriculture, is based, they are based on two, uh, two transformations. One, uh, removing grain quotas, and two, removing artificially low grain prices. So farmers that used to have to sell their uh, grain to the state now can sell on the open market. The same thing happens with milk. So agriculture is the foundation, it's the model of how these dairy reforms are carried out. And they do the same thing. They remove the quota for milk and they remove the low price for milk. And what comes out of this is the same thing that happens in agriculture. Production goes way up. And again, it doesn't go up in the same way throughout the country. Suddenly people start to invest in dairy. So you have, for example, one village in Hebei where they had a history of breeding dairy cows, this village went into debt, and debt is very important here because people are making commercial decisions to invest in dairy. The village goes into debt to buy dairy cows that they're gonna sell to dairies in Beijing and Tianjin, and they make piles of money doing this. Uh, the village of Hake, uh, near Hailar, again, way up at the top of China, uh, borrows heavily as a village um, to upgrade its production facilities and to get 40 head of dairy cattle, and they are now the sole producers for Nestle. So they have made a very good investment decision. But these investments all came, they started in the early 1980s. Um, what has happened since then, uh, a lot of things have happened since then. The industry has grown dramatically, and again, we're talking about growth. Uh, the industry has grown dramatically, but it's also consolidated. So a lot of the production used to be local, because it had to be, we're talking about milk, it can't go very far, it used to be local. Now because they can ship further away, which with uh, ultra high, uh, ultra heat treatment, UHT treatment, now you can move everything up to Inner Mongolia, everything up to uh, Northern Manchuria, and that has become the center of the industry, because you can. There's also political uh, emphasis on consolidating, because after China joins the WTO in 2001, um, they have to face competition, foreign competition, for uh, milk powder and things like this. So the government is pushing them, consolidate, consolidate. There is a price to consolidation, though, is that you get a price war. And out of a price war, you get a, uh, an invitation to bad behavior. And the bad behavior that came out of this 
scandal after scandal after scandal. So we know of the big ones, those are the ones that make it into the news, there are dozens of these, and they start in the 1980s. As soon as milk becomes a valuable commodity, you have more and more incentive to uh, misbehave. And that's where we're gonna leave production for now, on misbehavior. What about consumption? Consumption is a different story. So production is its own logic. It just gets bigger and bigger. Consumption is more than just production in, re in reverse. Uh, because the question isn't how much is being consumed, but by who, in what form, in what way, and you know, what, does it, what does it cost people? How do they consume? Um, so the other side of the question, who uh, was China making milk and milk products? We can start with the same question in reverse. Who is consuming all this stuff and how? Uh, one way, well, first of all, one thing we have to, to ask is, were Chinese people consuming milk? Because there is a common received wisdom that Chinese people thought milk was disgusting. And so we have a missionary up here uh, saying in pretty black and white terms, Chinese people think milk is disgusting. We have an anthropologist. We have the great historian Mark Elvin. They all repeated some version of this. Absolutely, Chinese people do not drink milk. It's gross. Not true. Uh, they consume milk in many different ways. For one thing, they consumed it medically, and not just cow milk. Um, this is a very TCM, Chinese medicine, approach. So when they say that it's sweet and settling, these are Chinese medical terms. But this is uh, from the 19th century. You can find other books that go back to the 13th, 14th century that give descriptions of milk in different forms as a medical, uh, uh, sort of an addition to a uh, medical diet. They also ate it because it was delicious. This is lao. So if you, if you say uh, cheese today, you call it nai lao. Traditionally, lao was this. Um, milk and sugar, you put them into a vat, you add a little bit of lao, you wait a day, and it becomes lao. What are they talking about? They're talking about yogurt. And this is from a book of uh, 19th century, a book about Beijing street food. And it was cheap, so they give the price of the food here. Su. Su is another one that's a traditional dish. So what you would do with these, you, you, you take the milk, you mix it up, uh, you, you uh, boil it down, you mix it up, and the skin that forms on top with the bubbles, you take that off, and that's su. You can roll it up and you put fruit inside. Um, and you see these mentioned. You see it mentioned in the Dream of the Red Chamber. There are two, uh, there's a scene in, in the Hunlo Meng where people are having a fight over a bowl of lao. And um, you know, if you don't know what that is, it makes the fight a lot more difficult to understand. Um, so who is consuming milk also comes to the question of what form. If you look at this northern, so the one that goes to Harbin, if you look at this northern uh, production model, uh, most of what is being made is being made into a processed product that is sold far away, butter, cheese, uh, and proteins, 75% of it. But that still leaves about a half a liter of fresh milk per person per day in the city of Harbin. That's a lot of milk. That's probably more milk than you drink. And that's how much was left over in Harbin. Um, here, if you look at the other cities, so these are you know, the, the eastern model, the, the model of the dairies, of the, the uh, concentrated dairies, um, they didn't make any processed product. Everything they made was sold fresh with, with a very small number of exceptions. So what that means is people were consuming milk like you would expect, a glass of milk, maybe ice cream, uh, but for the most part, they were just drinking the stuff. They were also giving it to babies. And um, this is interesting because cow milk and condensed milk in particular was, uh, you know, the, the kind that comes in a can. Uh, cow milk was considered not only a substitute for breast milk, it was considered to be preferable to breast milk. And this is because, you know, now the women have freedom. You don't have to wait around and breastfeed. Uh, but nutritionally and hygienically, 
it was considered to be superior. And you still see condensed milk sold this way in some parts of the world. You know, get it from a can, the, the way they sell infant formula. Uh, it's sold as not just a convenient substitute, but nutritionally, if you love your baby, you have to buy our product. That is very much how it was sold. So this is a, a baby bottle who, who can tell me what this says? It's, it is Japanese. It says we don't need uh, a nursemaid. And that's because you have this little bottle and you can put milk in it and away you go. By the 1950s, you have this massive expansion, state-sponsored expansion of dairy production. Who is it for? It is labeled as what they call a te shu ping, uh, special needs only. It was rationed. It was not for everyone. It was for people who needed it because milk is a high protein uh, commodity. So who, who were the people who got rationed uh, milk? Um, and milk, again, we're talking about milk in many different forms, um, particularly milk powder. What's all that industrial capacity doing? It's making milk powder so it can be shipped. Um, soldiers, that's one of the big ones. If you have a military base, you've got a dairy. Uh, cadres, so government officials. Um, over time, people with old or very young household members, particularly in the cities, because the cities were always favored places to live, um, they would get ration coupons like this one here. And uh, Beijing, it came to about a half a liter a day per household of the households that got these ration coupons. So again, it's a significant amount that's being produced, but you are not able to just walk on, you know, as a, as a consumer, you can't just walk in, give cash and buy it. You have to have these. So here's one from, uh, well, we're missing exactly where it is. It's up there behind the light, but uh, I think it's Shandong. Um, just some more of these coupons. Found them online. You can, you can buy milk coupons if you need them. Now, what you would see if, uh, if you could see these coupons more closely is the question of who's denominating it. Some of them are state dairies. Some of them are uh, small producers but they're not all coming from the same place. So even in this time that milk is very controlled, it's not a single production chain. Um, the 1980s, what comes out of the Deng Xiaoping reforms? A lot more milk is being made, but the amount of, of milk, the amount of uh, expansion is still not up to the market that's being created. So a lot more milk is being made, but a lot more milk is being demanded, and that produces scarcity. And so in the early 1980s, you have something called Mai Nai Nan. Uh, it's a scarcity of milk in the big uh, urban centers like Beijing. And um, sorry, I didn't get to talk about the, uh, oh, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, this produces a, a very severe reaction from the government, and they set up special purchasing structures for the cities to make sure that people, that urbanites, who are always the ones you have to, to take special care of, to make sure these people get milk because they demand. Um, by the 19, by the late 1980s, uh, the scarcity had had fixed itself. The market had come up to the proper price, uh, and more is being made. Not just more milk, but more interesting milk. Uh, again, this is when you start to have milk powder. This is when you have flavored milk powder. This is when you have flavored milk, a million different kinds of yogurt. Um, this is when anybody who was in, in China in the mid-90s, uh, was anyone in mid-China in, in the mid-90s? Meidong Gao? Meadow Gold. When Meadow Gold ice cream hit the market in about 1995, that was a magical day because you could have ice cream in China. I, I get a little choked up just thinking about it. It was really good ice cream. Um, you start to have these. You can have these delicious consumer products because it's, it's commodifying. Uh, but even then, why do I put this up? Because this is the king of Chinese dairy products, white rabbit candy. Uh, it looks like little, basically little milk-flavored Tootsie Rolls. And these are from the mid-1960s uh, when uh, Zhou Enlai met Nixon. He brought a bag of white rabbit candy. This is iconic. 
and they are, they are genuinely delicious. So by the 1990s, you have enjoyment of milk. It's becoming more commonplace. By the 2000s, it's not just commonplace, it's indispensable. It's not a product you uh, like to live with, it's a product you have to have. And the best example of this is when you have the melamine poisoning crisis. You have a crisis in 2004, uh, and then you have the melamine crisis in 2008. After these crises that are deadly and well known, the market for milk stays stable and it continues to grow. So you tell people, you know, milk in China, they'll say San Lu, and then they'll run off and buy some because Chinese people cannot live without milk. Meaning, what does milk mean? Nothing means more than the food we eat. There are layers and layers of cultural meaning in any food. Um, one of the traditional images, so if we talk about traditional images of milk, is of course motherly care, motherly love, breastfeeding. So you have Buddhist images of tigers that are, are weaning, uh, you know, fierce animals like tigers that are weaning uh, the Buddha on their milk. Um, I mentioned the dream of the Red Chamber, that there was a fight over this bowl of lao. Uh, just have a look at this. I hope you can read it from where you are. Why is this so significant? Because the people who are fighting over the bowl of lao are the women of the household, and the one who wants that bowl of lao breastfed the young master. I gave him my milk. He's going to keep this milk from me? I don't believe it. Drinks it off and runs away. Um, these images are there. Even if milk is not a daily common item of consumption, it's still something that people think about. The changes come when milk becomes a commodified product. And then the images get joined, the traditional images get joined by images from advertising, as they do. This is when we start to talk about milk not just as convenient, but as modern, uh, as uniquely healthy. People call it the perfect food. Uh, uniquely healthy, something you have to have, cow milk, you have to have it for your babies. Uh, you can't, you know, breastfeed them, you have to have this better product. Uh, it's uniquely nutritious. And again, if we're talking about the early 20th century, there is a lot of emphasis on the health of the nation. So there's political reform that, that is all mixed up with this idea that we have to uh, build ourselves spiritually and build ourselves physically. So we need to have people, Chinese people have to eat more protein. Why are they weak? Because they don't eat meat, they don't eat rice. Uh, and milk was a very commonly uh, prescribed way of getting out of that protein deficiency. To marketing images, once you have the 1950s, of course, all these brands have run away. Now it's the People's Republic of China. You have propaganda images of milk. And this genuinely surprised me. One of the, thing, the things you can do uh, with PRC sources is you can do a uh, word search, a keyword search in the major newspapers like Jamin Rebal. And I did a search for Niu Nai. And over 70 years, I found 5,000, 5,000 references to milk in the state newspaper of China. That's a lot. That's about one every five days. The Chinese newspapers were obsessed with milk during in the People's Republic of China. What did they talk about? They had a lot of images. One of them was, uh, well, well, we'll start with this one. Um, milk is necessary, follow this chain of logic. Milk is necessary. Everybody needs it, especially babies and old people. America produces a lot of milk. Americans cannot drink milk. That is evidence of capitalist depravity. And so one of the symbols that came up repeatedly was American farmers pouring milk out because it was not economical to sell. And meanwhile, people are starving. This is the image that comes up here. So we have John F. Kennedy being uh, enslaved by his dairy masters while Americans can't have milk. Um, the converse of this is how much milk is available in the Soviet Union, uh, in, in, in the socialist brother countries. Uh, like the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was, was one of the biggest consumers of milk. They drank about twice as much milk in, in uh, the Soviet Union as, as they did in the United States in the 1950, and about 100 times more than they did in China. 
So all this talk, while they're talking about milk once every five days, nobody's actually drinking the stuff. It's, it's kind of a dream, but it's a dream that is attainable because look what they're doing in Russia, look what they're doing in the Czech Republic, uh, East Germany, what have you. Another image that comes up is ethnic harmony. And why ethnic harmony? Because the ethnic minorities live on the grassland, and the grassland is full of cows, especially now that they're socialist cows, which are you know, naturally much happier. Um, so you have all of these images of the People's Liberation Army, for example, they go to Tibet, and they're welcomed by the people, which we all know is exactly what happened. Um, welcomed by the people, and how do you know the people love them? Because they bring them milk. You know, just spontaneously, the, sh the soldiers show up, the, the people kind of scurry out from their villages, have some milk, or have some butter. And so you have, you know, any, any time you, you talk about ethnic interaction, the presentation of milk is just, it's kind of a ritual. You don't even notice it. Whenever they talk about this peaceful village, they always have the, uh, the sort of the, you know, the, the, say the Mongolian village, Tibetan village, Qinghai village, they always have the same phrase. Uh, the, 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 the men are, um, uh, are riding the horses and the women are milking the cows. Always the same phrase. Um, so it's, it's in there, but you don't notice it. And it's still there. If you talk about intangible cultural heritage, this is a, uh, an application for intangible cultural heritage by some friends of mine who are Evenki in the very far north of Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, and they say that their way of preparing, actually, what, are they, what is she making here? She's making su, the same stuff that we were just talking about. Um, uh, their way of preparing milk is their unique cultural heritage that deserves recognition and funding from the United Nation. Um, and the last image is government efficiency, and this is something that comes from the 2000s, actually even before, from the 1990s. Um, one of the big changes in the way people talk about milk in the newspapers, in the 1950s, they are celebrating their success. By the 1980s, when milk comes back, they're a lot more critical. They're mentioning production scandals, they're mentioning production shortfalls, they're mentioning funding shortfalls, and in particular, they mention safety scandals in quite a lot of detail, surprising detail. So in, I think, 1988, uh, the People's, you know, People's Daily said all of the milk coming out of Heilongjiang is adulterated with water that is probably not safe to drink. That's, that's pretty striking for the state newspaper to make that kind of admission. But they always you know, sort of temper it with one thing. They always temper it with the idea that we're fixing these problems. So what comes out of the production scandals of 2004, 2008? This. This is uh, you know, uh, dumping all of the milk that was tainted with melamine. Uh, the, the head of San Lu was given the death penalty. And if you want to you know, look up Tian, Tian, Tian Haiwen, I, I forgot her name. Um, you know, you could see all of the pictures of her sitting in the dock, you know, with her hands together and the police holding her, her shoulders down, cause, you know, because she might make a run for it, this 70-year-old woman. Um, but, you know, she's become a symbol of how the government effectively deals with problems and problems that are important to you because this product is important to you. Closing thoughts. Um, this was, I hope, a fast, and uh, unfortunately I can't find a clock, so I hope I didn't go terribly far over time. Um, what's the value added of looking at these processes individually? Uh, for me, it was trying to get away from the idea that there has to be a single master narrative, because that would be very hard to do. It also let you put these chronologies on top of each other, uh, for example, when did the newspaper talk about milk the most? When production really was not reaching anyone. When you're talking about something like two and a half kilograms of milk per person per year, which is vanishingly small. It's like one glass of milk every two months. But they were talking about it constantly. That kind of juxtaposition comes out when you make these chronologies separate. But I think the real value for me the real value of looking at them this way is that the people who dealt with dairy historically or food historically 
or now also had very individuated needs. So the story that they would want to tell about milk would be very different depending on who you ask. You ask a cadre, uh, a government official in charge of a dairy, what tell me about milk? And he's gonna tell you one thing, more, 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 because that's his job and that's what he thinks about. That's what he thinks about in the past, that's what he thinks about in the present, and it's what he thinks about in the future. Where's it gonna go? We're gonna double production this year. Uh, you ask uh, uh, someone who sells milk in a shop, they're gonna wanna know what sells. They're gonna wanna know what consumers want. And you go on a blog and you look at, you know, and there are dozens of these, um, dozens, no, gotta be hundreds of these, uh, parental safety blogs where people are saying, what is safe for my children to eat? They are very naturally obsessed with this question and they will have very different concerns altogether. And these narratives are individuated and again, because each one has its own logic, it doesn't make sense to put them together without a reason to do so. So um, this, for example, I think is going to be what most of us, if we ever have to deal with questions like food, food production, uh, food sales, food markets, this is what most of us would see. And uh, this is 95% of what's published. It's industry profiles. Industry profiles are data, they're stats, and uh, uh, markets. It's interesting, it's important, but it's not the whole story. So that is all I've got for the moment, and thank you very much for listening.